Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Orisher Technologies. I'm Jessica Polk of the Current Consulting Group and will be conducting today's webinar presentation entitled the COVID-19 in the Workplace Survey. We'd like to thank Orisher for hosting today's webinar. Orisher Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. Their unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. The Intercept Oral Fluid Drug Test is an FDA-cleared laboratory-based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for nine drugs of abuse, including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepine, methadone, and opiates. Intercept is easy to administer and is ideal for the workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, clinical setting screening programs, and more. Today's presentation qualifies for continuing education from SHRM, CCDAP, and from HRCI for those who attend today's presentation in its entirety. You will receive information following today's webinar on how to apply for these credits. Today's presentation will be presented by Bill Current of the Current Consulting Group. Bill is the founder and the president of the Current Consulting Group with 30 years of industry, drug testing industry experience. He's authored 10 books on substance abuse related issues, and he regularly presents at conferences, seminars, workshops, and webinars. And he's widely considered one of the leading experts on drug testing and the drug testing industry. And with that, I will turn the virtual microphone over to Bill. Well, thank you, Jessica, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, as I was listening to Jessica read my bio there, um, it's hard to believe that it's been just almost 31 years now. And I was on the phone earlier today with my very good friend, Joe Kenny from First Advantage, and we were, um, we were admitting to one another that we've been around a long time. And uh, of course, no one's ever been through anything like what we're going through now. So this is really sort of a unique time in the history of the drug testing industry. We at Current Consulting Group conduct an industry survey every year. We've been doing it since 1999. And this year, in addition to the industry survey, which we'll be conducting later in the year, we decided to add a workplace COVID survey uh, to see what impact the, the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic has had on drug testing from both an employer perspective and from a provider perspective. So this is the agenda that we're going to follow today as we go through the presentation. And let me just say from the beginning that one thing that we've we've learned, we've experienced since the pandemic started is that it is a very fast changing, evolving situation. And so many of you probably know from following the CDC guidelines, the guidelines from the EEOC and other government agencies, as well as state reopen guidelines, that they're in a constant state of being changed and updated. And so this is a, a month old data now that we're gonna be looking at. Um, some things may have evolved and changed and where I'm familiar with additional changes, I'll point those out during today's presentation. But this is the survey that we conducted um, as part of this special, this is not our regular industry survey, it's a special COVID in the workplace survey. So, um, as you know, many aspects of the drug testing industry have been impacted directly by the COVID-19 pandemic. How collections are done, the introduction and growing popularity of telehealth, telehealth collections. We're seeing a lot more saliva alcohol tests, I'll talk about that in a minute, and then the promotion, the adoption, the use of alternative testing methods, especially lab-based oral fluid testing. And I'm not saying that just because oral fluid, our Orisher is conducting or hosting today's webinar, but we were starting to see sort of a slow movement in that direction as we went into this year because of the um, issue of, or the issuance of the uh, oral fluid mandatory guidelines from SAMHSA back in October of 2019. Seems like forever ago, right? But they put out these guidelines back in October with about a 12 to 18 month implementation period. And so we were anticipating um, more lab-based oral fluid testing as a result of these sort of uh, gold standards that were issued by the federal government endorsing lab-based oral fluid testing. But the pandemic has sort of pushed us in that direction faster. 
And so I'll talk about that in, in a minute, but we'll also talk a little bit about predicting the future trends based on what the survey results tell us. Now, survey participants went down one of two different tracks, the employer side, those who are the end users of drug testing services and the provider side. And so we really did two surveys at one time by doing it this way. 56% of the people that participated in the survey were industry providers, drug testing companies, TPAs, laboratories, et cetera. On the other side, about 44% were the end users of drug testing, the, the companies that buy drug testing. And so we're gonna focus a little bit in both directions, but let me ask you a question to start today's presentation. Which category do you fall in? Are you an employer that purchases drug testing, that drug tests your employees, but you're, you're an end user of drug testing, or are you a provider of drug testing services or related services? So, or other, you might be in another camp altogether. Let me give you just a second to respond to that question, and then Jessica will put up the answers. But in our survey, when we sent the survey out, you can see the breakdown was 56% providers, 44% sort of traditional end user employers. Okay, so, how are we doing on the survey results there, Jessica? So on today's call, 53% of you uh, identified as industry providers, drug testing providers, 25% as employers, purchasers of drug testing, and 22% falling into the other category. Okay, so with that in mind, let's launch into the survey and I will share results from both of our surveys, the employer part and the survey part. So the first question we asked was, have you experienced a drop in drug testing volume since the pandemic started from the employer's perspective, okay? And so you see the bars at the bottom, those are percentages at the bottom that have seen, um, that have shown a drop in those, in those ranges. And then the percentage at the top of the bar are the percentage of respondents who pick that choice. So if you look to the far left, you see that 48.15% of our respondents, the survey participants, said that they had seen a drop in drug testing volume at their company as a, as a user of drug testing services of between zero and 10%. So 48%, that's the largest bar, right? Look all the way over to the far right, you find that just over 21% said that they had seen a drop in drug testing at their company of 61% or more. And if you add it to the bar just to the left, that light blue one of 11.1%, you have about almost a third, if you combine the two, the light blue and the green at the far end, uh, about a third of companies are saying they've seen a drop in drug testing volume of 41% or more. Now look in the, the dark blue box there. Those are the provider responses. 35% of industry providers reported a 41 to 60% drop in their volume of drug tests performed since the start of the pandemic. Now, now let's look at this, this, this pie chart here for the provider drop in revenue from drug testing since the pandemic started. So that dark green slice of the pie it indicates that 23% of the survey respondents said they had seen a drop in revenue from drug testing of 61% or greater. And that sort of darkish gray one at the bottom, that's 33% said that seen, they had seen a drop in revenue of between 41 and 60%. If you combine the two, that's well over half of drug testing providers have seen a loss in revenue, a drop in revenue of 41% or greater. That zero to 10%, that dark blue um, slice of the pie at the very top, that's just 7%. 7% saying that the revenue drop has been somewhere between zero and 10%. But as you can see, looking at the light blue on the right side, uh, somewhere around the three o'clock mark on the, on the pie there, 27% had seen a drop of 21 to 40%, 33% had seen a drop of 41 to 60%, and 23%, almost one in five providers, have lost revenue at 61% or greater. Pretty significant, right? So the employer alterations to their drug testing practices has a direct impact on those previous two slides, right? So look at the top to the left, and let me just um, activate the, the pointer, the spotlight. Okay, so right here, we temporarily halted drug testing until the end of the pandemic, Almost one in four, 20, almost 23% said that they have temporarily halted drug testing until the pandemic ends. And if you go all the way over to the other side, 
just about 3% said they have permanently discontinued drug testing and have no plans to return to drug testing. So that's that's where you're seeing that drop in drug testing volume. You're also seeing the, the decrease in revenue from drug testing. That's having a direct impact on the industry. Now, this, this large green part here are those who said they have not been altered at all. That's about 55.5%. And you think that's a really strong number, percentage compared to the rest of the pie. But, you know, six, seven months ago, it would have been 100%. Or 95%. You know, I mean, there's always fluctuation in drug testing volume and drug testing revenue, but that's a pretty significant drop that we're that we're seeing now. Um, let me take the pointer off so I can advance the slide. Now we also ask employers. And that's the the horizontal bar graph, and then the the providers are in the dark green box. We also asked what they anticipate the third and fourth quarter uh, to be in terms of drug testing. And so we're now in the third quarter, of course, we're well into the third quarter. And you can see right in the middle on the horizontal bar graph, 56.3% of employers said that they anticipate the number of drug tests staying about the same. And below that 35.56%, we anticipate performing more drug tests in the third and fourth quarter. Look up at the green box. 83% of industry providers indicated that they expect the volume of drug tests they perform in the third and fourth quarters to increase. Now, we asked this question prior to the quote unquote resurgence of the COVID uh, pandemic, sort of, you know, this increase that we're seeing in a lot of places. I live in Florida, and so we've had a dramatic increase here in Florida. And so I don't know if employers and, and providers would answer the question quite the same way if it would be quite this high. What we're hearing from a lot of companies is that they're doing their best to sort of keep up with things with anticipation of seeing an increase in drug testing volume returning in the first quarter of next year. Uh, maybe the fourth quarter of this year a little bit more, definitely in the first quarter of next year. I have talked to companies though that have seen increases since the unemployment rate has been dropping. And so, um, there, there is some volume increase. We don't know exactly precisely how much yet, but it is going up, but not quite as fast as perhaps a lot of companies were hoping to see in the third and fourth quarter. So under the category of provider discontinuation of drug testing during the pandemic, these are providers. If you look to the, to the, to the dark green um, slice of the pie on the left, providers saying we have not lost any clients due to the pandemic, 41%, right? On the flip, on the other side, 49% said, yes, we have lost clients who have decided to temporarily discontinue drug testing. Now, these are the providers talking, and that little solid blue slice of the pie up around 12 o'clock is they have lost clients who have decided to permanently discontinue drug testing. This is from the, the provider perspective. Why are the numbers so much different on the provider perspective versus the employer perspective? It's because the employer who's participating in the survey is speaking on behalf of one company. And so their response is just on behalf of their company. The providers are thinking of the hundreds and sometimes thousands of clients that they have. And if you think of it in those terms, then that dark green slice of the pie, we of course would want to see that much, much higher, right? That we have not lost any clients due to the pandemic, about 41%. We'd like to see that much, much higher. Now, as I said earlier, there's always fluctuation in drug testing, right? Clients come, clients go, it's somewhat of a takeaway industry. So you're learning, lear losing clients to one um, competitor, but then you're taking clients from another competitor and it all sort of evens out. But to have only 41% of, of providers say that they've not lost any clients. And then on the flip side, nearly 50% saying they have lost clients at least temporarily due to the pandemic. Those are significant changes in our industry. Both employer concerns about cost of drug testing are significant right now. Why? Because everybody's budgets have been significantly affected by the pandemic, right? We make widgets. We're not selling very many widgets now. We're not meeting our sales projections because people aren't buying widgets. Well, that affects their budget all over. And some of the things that get cut are programs like drug testing. We don't like to see that because as long as employees are in the workplace, there's always the concern and the fear of drug abuse and how it could affect the workplace. But 
there are significant percentages of employers that indicated that they're concerned. 8% very concerned, 21% somewhat concerned. Then over to the around the six o'clock, you see not very concerned, 30, 38%, a little bit of concern there, right? Only 33% said they're not concerned at all. But as the pand pandemic stretches on and we're not fully back into full operation again, those percentages could shift. Drug testing suspension, what types of drug testing were suspended? You know, follow-up testing, post-accident, pre-employment, et cetera, right? So these are the employer responses in the green bars. 24.6% of employers said that they have suspended random testing. And to the left of it, pre-employment, 13.4%. So significant, right? Uh, there's always, again, changes that are occurring, but about one in four employers indicate that they have suspended random testing. We would expect to see a drop in pre-employment testing under these circumstances because there was less hiring going on, but maybe not so much in random testing. So look all the way over to the right. 66% of respondents, a little over that, said that they've not suspended any type of drug testing, meaning they may be doing less drug testing because maybe they have fewer people that they're hiring or fewer people in the workplace, or maybe more people working from home and not really subject to um, reasonable suspicion testing, perhaps. 66% have not suspended any drug testing at all, even though the volume may have gone down. Now, in the dark blue box are the provider responses. 59% of you, people in the industry, reported that they had had clients suspend random testing, 31% said they had no clients suspend testing at all. But we would expect to see suspensions along this, this uh, graph here in certain categories based on the unemployment rate. Now, this is critical. Coming into the year, 34 states had already legalized marijuana and 11 of those states had legalized it for recreational use. There's legislation being considered by state legislatures at this very moment. So those numbers could change. And I might add that at one time or another, and on the Democrat side very recently, both presidential candidates had indicated that they were in favor of legalizing marijuana on a federal basis. So we may see a, a, a seismic shift in that in the coming months, depending on, on how the election turns out. Marijuana definitely going in the direction of more states legalizing it. But are companies still testing for it? So we've got states that have placed restrictions on uh, testing for THC, like in New York City, on a pre-employment exam. Although safety sensitive positions, many of them have been carved out and you can still test for THC on a pre-employment test in New York City for those positions. And other states have, have put anti-discrimination uh, language into their marijuana laws that would prevent an employer from taking any kind of adverse employment action against a, an individual who tests positive. However, some of those states also include language that says that employers don't have to tolerate employees being in wor at work impaired by marijuana. But are they still testing for marijuana? Are we seeing a shift there? So in the blue box, let me start with that. that these are the provider responses. 15% of people in, uh, in the drug testing industry reported that some clients have removed marijuana from their drug test panel during the pandemic. And if you look on the far right, that, that uh, donut there, 5% of employers said that they have removed marijuana from their drug test panel. 95% said no. Is that significant? I think it is. One, of course, the providers are, are reacting to the question based on thousands and thousands of clients that they represent. So that's a lot of companies. If you figure that there are about somewhere between 28 million and 32 million employers that do drug testing, and, and the number shifts always, but I can back up 28 million. Well, a 15% decrease is pretty significant. If 15% of 28 million companies remove marijuana from their drug test panel, well, that's a lot of companies not testing for marijuana anymore. And so the significance in these two numbers is, is pretty important. And even if only 5% um, of employers say they've removed marijuana from their panel, 5% of 28 million is still a pretty big number, almost a million right there, right? So important to know these numbers and what they actually represent. A lot of companies, maybe, maybe not 
you know, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, but lots of companies have reported trouble arranging traditional urine collection services, or maybe any type of service through a professional collector. It's not a, I don't think this is so much a, um, a comment on urine versus oral fluid versus hair, but just the collection process, which many employers, you know, they, they rely on a TPA to make that happen for them. But some of them have been reporting that collection services have been challenging to arrange during the pandemic. The pie on the left represents the responses of the employers. 20% have indicated that they've had trouble arranging collection services. Well, 20% is not 80%, which is the, the percentage that said no, but 20% is high. That's a lot of companies saying that they've been having problems. And on the other side of the survey, 52% of providers reported that they have had some clients indicate trouble arranging collection services during the pandemic. Either maybe the service that they traditionally use has uh, reduced hours of operation, or maybe they've closed at least temporarily, or maybe they're not doing collections for drug tests now because they're so busy doing COVID tests, any number of possible reasons. But if you're in the drug testing business and you rely, of course, on that collection getting done, and 20% of your clients are saying, hey, I'm having problems getting my collections done, that creates problems for the provider, and you've got to find a way to do that. Now, I will report that, you know, from anecdotally from all of my discussions, the lab patient service centers are up and functioning. They're providing their services. Some of the major um, collection service and auc health service providers, all functioning, services available, but yet there are still a number, a pretty significant percentage of, of, of employers saying that they're having a problem. And that could get worse as the pandemic, pandemic stretches on. And, and COVID testing becomes more, more commonplace. Um, this is just a, a breakdown of the previous percentage when I showed you the, um, whoops, the 52% of, uh, let me go back here, the 52% of providers saying that they've had clients having trouble versus 47% saying no. Now, as client companies have had trouble doing traditional urine testing, they've looked at alternative testing methods. And so we're seeing some movement on the oral fluid drug testing side of companies either switching to lab-based oral fluid testing or adding lab-based oral fluid testing to an existing program. Let me preface this part, because you're looking at these slides now and, and you're wondering what it all means, right? Let me preface this by saying that during the, um, the um, uh, oral fluid mandatory guidelines that were issued in October as part of those guidelines, SAMHSA projected that in three to four years, let's say four years, okay, let's be generous there, in about four years time, after oral fluid is fully implemented, after the implementation period ends, four years from then, 25 to 30% of all federal drug testing will be lab-based oral fluid testing. That was their projection. And they said once DOT adds lab-based oral fluid testing, you can expect the same percentage to switch to or add lab-based oral fluid testing to their programs. So that's the projection from back in October. What's going on now as a result of the pandemic? <clears throat> Excuse me. 80% of, of employers have said, no, we are not planning to switch or add oral fluid testing to our drug testing program. Pretty healthy, dominant percentage, right? Now let's look down below. No, but we are planning to switch to oral fluid testing 12%, and 7.5% have said, yes, we have already switched to lab-based oral fluid testing. So if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you add those two together, we're looking at nearly 20%, or yeah, about 20%, 19 and point something, that have either switched to lab-based oral fluid testing or added it, or have plans to do so. Now, look at the pre-pandemic volume of drug testing, right? Most experts would agree that pre-pandemic, there was about 40 million drug tests being done, workplace drug tests being done every year. And some percentage of that were already oral fluid drug tests. But if 20% of companies either have already added or switched to oral fluid testing and or plan to do so, that's another 8 million drug tests out of 40 million. So that's a significant percentage. Let's say that 
Oral fluid testing represented 8% of all drug tests pre-pandemic, and we're talking about another 20%. Well, suddenly, the projections that DOT put out there are three to four years ahead of time, all because of the pandemic. And in the blue box to the right, you see 80% of providers indicated that their clients have not switched to or added oral fluid testing, a higher percentage than what the employers are telling us, right, the 80%, but still a significant number of companies have as, a, as, a, as a, an effort to sort of deal with some of the challenges that they're faced with, switched to or added oral fluid testing to their program. Almost no one has stopped, right? If you look at that, that large green area there, 92% have not discontinued uh, an existing oral fluid testing program, even though it only perhaps represented eight to 10% of the total market. But some companies planning to, at least temporarily, some coming companies planning to do it permanently, not quite to the near or coming near the percentages of company companies that have either <clears throat> dropped marijuana or plan to discontinue drug testing altogether. But important numbers to know. Now, this is also very interesting, right? So this is the perception of risk associated with the collection of certain types of specimens. So you've got blood. 4.4% of our, our respondents said that they felt blood was the least or was the lowest risk sample. 29% <clears throat> said hair, 12.5% uh, oral fluid saliva, and 53% urine. So urine still leads the pack, but only at 53%, right? So six, seven, eight months ago, that percentage perhaps would have been 99%, um, just because there was no real sort of concern about it. But now companies are concerned about the proximity between the collector and the donor, um, the use of uh, personal protection uh, devices like a, a mask or gloves, sanitizing areas, et cetera, and looking at alternative methods, perhaps more so than they would have just for the decrease in the risk of exposure to the coronavirus. So <clears throat> we're about to the halfway mark in our presentation pause to take a drink of water, and just ask you to think about these two questions. These are not polls, but just think about that. Should I discontinue drug testing during the pandemic to ensure the safety of my employees? That's a question many employers are asking. Do you anticipate current federal regulations changing in order to accommodate drug testing challenges during the pandemic? And we've already seen that with DOT, right? We've seen them issue a temporary three-month waiver for pre-employment testing, of individuals who remained as part of a of a of a of a pool um, or who were subject to testing maybe with another company, uh, we've seen some some sort of flexibility in their guidance on getting random tests done. Do your best, document all the challenges that you may be facing. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of that already. But think about those things because those are the questions that employers are struggling with right now. One of the things that has happened during the pandemic has been the advent of telehealth collections. I sometimes call them remote video observed collections, but it's where the collector and the donor or the employee are in two different locations altogether. And the collector is observing the collection of an oral fluid sample typically of somebody in another location via some type of video application. So like Zoom, for example, or proof. Um, proof is more of a, a program that's been developed specifically <clears throat> for drug test collections. Companies using Zoom or go to webinar or something like that where you have that video observation. <clears throat> but it's a remote video observed collection. So how's it going during the pandemic? Well, isn't this interesting? Employers said only four percent of employers said that they have shown they have had interest in telehealth collections, but 17% of providers say that they have clients inquiring about telehealth collections. Back in January, that 4% would have been zero in the workplace market. And the 17% would have been, who knows, 1% maybe, who knows, but they wouldn't have existed. And so if 4% of, of all drug tests happened through some type of telehealth collection system, that's a significant shift. That's more work going toward an alternative collection method. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying this is the reality. This is what people are telling us. And these, these statistics are a month old. And so in this ever and quickly changing situation that we're in, 
that those percentages could have shifted significantly in that in that just that short amount of time. So providers offering telehealth observed collections, about three out of four saying no, 10% saying yes, but another 16% saying they are considering doing it. So in part, those percentages probably have increased, but in part because they're responding to their client's demand for the service. And we're seeing more of that. Now, telehealth collections have been going on in other drug testing markets for some time now successfully. So not so much in the workplace market, but maybe more in drug treatment or drug monitoring in the insurance industry where they do drug test collections as well. They have been doing this somewhat <clears throat> uh, for some time now. Now let's ruminate on a couple of more questions. Is it legal for you to perform virtual collections of your employees? Are there any state laws that prevent it? Are there any federal laws that prevent it? And then why are telehealth collections a good option during the pandemic? As you consider those two questions, let me just say, I'm not aware of any state laws that would prevent telehealth collections. They certainly are not preventing telehealth collections in certain industries, as I said, like insurance and drug, uh, drug treatment, et cetera. But we would wanna make sure, according to certain state drug testing laws, that we're following the same procedures if we're doing telehealth as opposed to in-person collections. So an option worth considering, certainly. Um, will it catch on or is it just a temporary fix? I can't really say, except I'm thinking a lot of the changes that we're talking about probably stay in effect for the most part when the pandemic is over. So that leads us to workplace COVID-19 testing, which is becoming a big deal, right? So keep in mind these, these stats are from a month ago. Lots changed just in the last month, but provider client interest in COVID-19 testing. So these are the providers responding. What percentage of your clients have, have shown an interest in COVID testing through you, the provider? Three out of four, 76%. No, but they anticipate it, another 13.5%. No, we don't anticipate it, 10%. So you're looking at a, almost 90% um, of, of providers saying that their clients are coming to them with interest in COVID testing or anticipating inquiries about COVID testing from their clients. How many providers are actually providing COVID testing services right now? Well, the dark blue on the, the right side from 12 o'clock to about four o'clock is 35%. So a month ago, 35.8% of providers said they're already offering COVID-19 testing. The light blue wedge there, no, but we plan to it. So now we're looking at 60 plus percent saying that they're either doing it or they're planning to do it, and this was a month ago. Only 38% saying they have no plans to provide COVID-19 testing services. This is an important thing because if your clients can't purchase COVID testing from you, the provider, then obviously if they're interested in it, they're gonna provide, they're gonna buy it somewhere else. And probably they're gonna buy it from another drug testing provider who would then have access to your client on other services that you currently provide. So we'll probably see that number of providers that are either doing it or preparing to provide COVID testing go up significantly in the coming months. Because I don't think the COVID testing uh, opportunity is going away anytime soon. Challenges to perform, performing COVID testing are significant. So the blue bars represent what employers said. At the very top, 13.4% saying they're not sure if it's legal, state laws. The price, it can be, it's a different price category than drug testing, right? Right in the middle, no desire to do it, about 40%. That doesn't mean they're not gonna do it, they just wish they didn't have to do it, right? And you see on and on and on, down to the very end, which is the accuracy of the test, because you're seeing a lot of information in the media about the accuracy of different COVID testing methods, whether it's a viral test or an antibody test, and what does the result mean from the viral versus the antibody, and which ones are accurate. And there was a big headline on the internet today online <clears throat> about the accuracy of certain types of tests. And it, the headline didn't answer the question. Um, and I didn't want to paint myself in a certain way for today's webinar, but it seemed to be teasing that certain point of collection COVID test results are not accurate. Well, who knows what that means, right? It's not apples to apples compared to drug testing, but it is a different way in which we screen employees. Providers, looking at the accuracy as one of the issues that they need to be concerned about, of course, just like they would with drug testing. 
But a lot of them, if you look sort of down towards the middle, they just don't know enough about it yet. And so a lot of information that you typically get on drug testing every month, regular on a regular basis from Orsure webinars and from SAPA webinars and SAPA conferences, et cetera, and NDASA, et cetera, well, it just doesn't exist for COVID testing yet. So there's a breach there that needs to be filled in. But on the issue of legality, 30% of industry providers said they were uncertain if it was legal <clears throat> in the states where they operate. Among employers, the, the pie graph there, um, you see that 57% is the green. Those are the employers that said, I don't know if it's legal. And 41% saying, yes, it is. Let me say this, that <clears throat> we do a lot of research on this at the current consulting. And so far we haven't found any states that legally don't allow COVID testing in the workplace. That's not the concern. The concern is what can we do with the results and what type of tests should we use and when can a test be administered and when can somebody return to work based on a, a uh, negative COVID test result, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of questions, but no states just not allowing it for legal purposes legal in every state so far, federal regulations to guide us in the process of development. Um, but, but we're not seeing any state reopen guidelines that say don't do workplace COVID testing. But if you're gonna do it, it reminds me of where we were 30 something years ago in the drug testing industry, where our catchphrase was uh, drug testing, do it right or don't do it at all. Well, we're well past that on the drug testing side, right? Because there's so many accurate ways to do drug testing. Now with COVID testing, I think the, the catchphrase now applies, do it right or don't do it at all. Make sure that you're protecting the safety and the integrity of your workers and your job applicants with COVID testing like you would with drug testing and all other types of precautions that you would normally take with drug testing apply to COVID testing as well. So let's think about this for a second. What types of tests can be purchased by an employer and used to determine COVID-19 infections in the workplace? Remember I mentioned Viral tests, those are the ones that show whether somebody has a current infection. Or antibody tests, which show if somebody has had an infection in the past. We don't know if a negative viral test means somebody won't be positive a day or two later because of the incubation period that, that takes place when somebody is initially infected by the coronavirus. But it does tell you at that moment they're negative. And with the antibody tests, whether or not somebody can become reinfected, we just don't know those things yet. But the test results provide important information to an employer who's trying to safeguard his or her workplace. So should I be testing my employees for COVID-19? That is the question that we're gonna be asking and answering for months to come as more and more employers return to the workplace, employees return to the workplace, and employers make every effort to secure the safety and the health and the well-being of their workplaces and their workforces. Now, the pandemic has had an impact on alcohol testing. So volume has dropped, okay? You see 66.9% saying it has dropped slightly, zero to 10%. That's probably, that zero to 10% on drug testing and alcohol testing is probably in the normal range because of the fluctuation with companies uh, adding uh, testing, then dropping testing, getting into it, then getting out of it but it's those bars to the right that we're concerned about, right? So all the way to the far right, we've had over 18% of employers indicate that they've seen a drop in alcohol testing volume of 61% or greater, and 6.6% saying it's been between 41 and 60%. <clears throat> those are the two bars that I'm most concerned about as I analyze the data. So combining them, that's about one in four employers indicating that they've seen a, a significant drop in alcohol testing. In the blue box, you see the provider's response. 28% of industry providers reported that they have had a 0 to 10% drop in alcohol testing volume since the start of the pandemic. A little bit different, right, when you compare the two. But of course, the providers are thinking of their thousands, their hundreds, and their thousands of, of clients when they answer that question. 12.4% of employers say that they have discontinued alcohol testing at this time. 24% of industry providers say they've had clients discontinue alcohol testing. Again, we know the reason why, but that's still a significant drop in volume, right? 
If you're selling alcohol tests, if you're conducting alcohol tests of your employees, that's a significant drop. Only 87.6% said there has been no drop, right? But six months ago, it would have been 99% saying there'd been no drop. Breath alcohol testing has taken a little bit of a hit during the pandemic. Any type of testing method involving breath would be of concern to a lot of people, as you can see on the slide. About one in four on the pie chart there, one in four saying that they have concerns about breath alcohol testing, 76% saying no. Look at the blue box now. 62% of providers reported that none of their clients have had concerns about breath alcohol testing since the pandemic began. 62% in the blue box for providers, 76% over there on the pie chart for employers. But I'd be concerned about that 24%. I think it it's a, it's per, portends some type of concern going forward about testing methods involving breath. And, and, and again, here we're talking about the deep lung breath sample, air sample that's required to do a, a breath analysis. <clears throat> Don't know if that's a permanent thing or what impact it has going forward. It's a concern right now. But are companies switching to saliva alcohol testing if they're concerned about breath? And so look at the very bottom, only 6.6% .6 have said yes. 5% have said no, but they're planning to. Still a healthy 88% of employers saying they're not planning to give up on breath alcohol testing. But again, six months ago, that would have been 99.9%. .9%. And so that drop from 99.9% .9 probably to 88% is significant. 84% of providers have not had clients add or switch to saliva alcohol testing, but 6.6% .6 have. And so if you're in the business, you're probably selling more saliva alcohol tests than you were in the past. And if you're a provider, you're probably looking at it. About 11, 12% of you have either switched to or seriously consider uh, switching to saliva alcohol testing. So the question that you want to ask yourself is, can alcohol testing be performed via telehealth collection? Because telehealth collections are catching uh, traction here. And what is the safest way to perform an alcohol test during the pandemic? Those are, those are questions you have to ask yourself and answer for yourself when it comes to safeguarding the security, the safety, the health of your workplace and your workforce. Now, just a couple of general things to close. And let me just say, as we come in to sort of the last few minutes of the webinar today, if you have any questions, please use the chat function to submit your questions. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions about the survey results or any test uh, questions about drug testing, whether it be traditional testing, oral fluid testing, saliva alcohol testing, et cetera. Um, I'll entertain any type of questions that you have regarding drug testing, and in particular, the survey results and the impact of the pandemic. Again, I wanna, I, we're gonna go into a couple of slides here with some general information, but <clears throat> I wanna reemphasize a couple of points. One is the information is changing constantly. So I think if we do this survey, say 60 to 90 days from now, we'll see some, in some categories, we'll see some significant changes as the pandemic continues, as employers hire more workers, as they're trying to get their drug testing done, um, as they face perhaps a, a few more states uh, legalizing marijuana, et cetera, we'll see some of these numbers shift as a way of uh, um, sort of reacting to that. And also I think as COVID testing becomes more commonplace, we'll have a lot more questions related to what can I really do in my state? State laws will come into view very quickly when it comes to COVID testing. We know that federally, the, <clears throat> the EEOC has ruled that COVID-19 represents a direct threat to the workplace. And therefore, certain guidelines, certain restrictions have been suspended by the EEOC during the pandemic when it comes to COVID testing and measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. What happens when the EEOC lifts that direct threat? Well, we don't know, but state laws will definitely have an impact on what employers do and certainly on what they think they can do. So for example, who pays for a COVID-19 test? Well, the EEOC has ruled that a COVID test would typically be considered a medical exam. And there are many states that have laws that require employers to pay for medical exams that they, the employer, require of employees and job applicants. So if this is a required test, there are many states that are gonna require the employer to pay for that COVID-19 test. 
other states where there might be a little bit of flexibility. But the bottom line is that there are going to be a lot of issues and questions that can only be answered by looking at the state laws and looking at the state reopen guidelines that have been issued. All 50 states have reopen guidelines. They're all available online. Just type in the Oklahoma reopen guidelines and you'll get you'll get sent to the right um, website for Oklahoma and any other state. You just put in the state name and then put in reopen guidelines. We have a database that we've collected, but it's in constant motion. And so you have to check those reopen guidelines regularly as local governments respond to um, changes in the in the pandemic. Now, here's a loaded question, right? So as a provider, are you offering more webinars during the pandemic? We're seeing a lot of webinars, right? You're on one right now. I did 10 webinars in June for my clients, uh, the most ever in one month. Yes, 17.7%, almost 18%. And then no, about three quarters, 72.78%. Some planning to do more, some planning to decrease, but the sort of webinar craze is going on and probably going to stay into effect for a little while. Have you attended more webinars since the start of the pandemic? Well, yes, is that law, that big blue slice of the pie there, 68%. No is the, the green one, and then the light blue is 27%. Uh, no, but I plan to is the green one, then 27% for um, no plans to attend more webinars. But webinars have become very, very popular. Have you updated your drug testing policy? <clears throat> During the pandemic, this has been a perfect time to, well, things are kind of slowed down and you can focus to focus on your drug testing policy. So 20% of employers said, yes, we have updated our policy during the pandemic. 10% said no, but we plan to. 70% said no, we're not really planning to. That's a big mistake because if you're going to add COVID testing, for example, you need to have a COVID policy, testing policy. If you're altering your program to allow for saliva alcohol testing, for example, that needs to be added to your policy. Same with oral fluid drug testing, same with point of collection drug testing, same with any alterations that you make to your program. They must be reflected in your policy and they must reflect the very state laws that apply to your company. So as the market, the drug testing buyers respond to the pandemic, they should be updating their policies and providers should be helping them with that. So we should see significant increases to that blue bar in the next 30 to 60 days. Online supervisor training, again, a perfect time to get caught up on all of your supervisor training while your supervisors are maybe working from home. They can take online courses. 36% said yes. Doesn't seem like a big number compared to 64% who said no, but I can tell you that 36% is significant. That's a big jump. Only 20% of providers uh, reported that they've had clients inquire about it, but 36% of the employers who responded to the survey said yes we are doing more with online supervisor training. So we're at the end of the formal presentation. There's a ton more data from the survey. Um, just in the time that we had, we thought we would try to keep it to about 45 to 50 minutes of, of presentation time. If you have questions about trends related to the pandemic as it relates to, to COVID testing in the workplace or drug testing during the pandemic, you can reach out to Orsher Technologies. Their people have all the data from the survey, and I'm sure they would be really happy to entertain and answer any questions that you have, even beyond the, the information that was in today's webinar presentation. We've been getting asked this question a lot. Uh, it wasn't necessarily in the survey results, but it would be a question that we would ask in a future survey. Um, it, and that question is, uh, what can you do with the result of a COVID test? And last month, I co-presented with Jackie Perone from Orsher Technologies on COVID testing. It was very informative on the technology and the application of COVID testing in the workplace and in other markets as well, I'm sure. <clears throat> but one of the big questions that we got as part of that webinar and following the webinar was what as employers can we do with the result? So let's create a correlation with drug testing. So with drug testing, uh, depending on the state, you do a pre-employment test and you can refuse to hire somebody who tests positive. Um, and I'm not talking about <clears throat> states that have placed restrictions on marijuana, okay? That's a different ball game. But with COVID testing, the EEOC has ruled that 
employers can conduct pre-employment COVID testing as long as they conduct COVID testing of all applicants for a position. So they can't discriminate against anybody. They can't just COVID test the tall people or the short people, but everyone who would be a candidate for that job or a finalist for a position must be subject to the same testing. But if somebody tests positive, the employer can refuse to hire that individual if they test positive for COVID-19. That's the pre-employment side. On the employer side, excuse me, on the employee side, you would be allowed to send somebody home if they test positive or if they're demonstrating the, um, the symptoms of, of, of COVID infection. <clears throat> but there's still some ambiguity on the long-term result of or rights of the employer when it comes to that individual. We'll ask those questions in the follow-up survey that we're gonna do a little bit later towards the beginning of the fourth quarter this year to find out a little bit more about what employers are doing. When this survey was conducted, we really didn't have that kind of data available to, to know to ask that question because COVID testing was so new. But now, two, three months into the future, as more and more companies gain a little bit of experience with COVID testing, we'll have some information about that that we can provide. We'll ask those questions in the next survey and then make it part of um, some type of webinar presentation that we do at the end of the year. And it also comes back to another issue that has come up uh, on COVID testing in the workplace, which is the whole privacy issue. Uh, won't, some, won't employees know when somebody's been pulled aside for COVID testing? And to some extent that may be true, but nobody's entitled to know the results of somebody's COVID test. Um, and uh, Yvette Farnsworth from Current Consulting Group did a webinar for Orisher back in June, I believe it was, where she answered legal questions. And so you have, if you have questions about that, uh, Yvette, who's an attorney, answered those questions during that webinar. And I'm sure that your Orisher reps would be happy to give you, provide the link for those, uh, those two webinars, Jackie's webinar last month and Yvette's webinar the month before, uh, so that you can get those kinds of answers if you, if you have any, if you have any of those types of questions. And I think Jessica, with that, that brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you everybody for joining us and I'll turn it back over to Jessica. On behalf of Orisher Technologies, we'd like to thank you for your attendance today. Again, if you have any questions after today's webinar, please feel free to submit them to your Orisher representative. Today's presentation had pre-qualified for continuing education credit from SHRM, CCDAP, and from HRCI for those who attended the entire live presentation. And we will be sending you out that information via email as well as a link to today's recording so you can review these slides again and share them with your colleagues. We would like to one more time thank Orisher Technologies for hosting today's webinar and for their contribution to this information that was presented today. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you and have a nice day.